Okay. So first item on the agenda is any additions or modifications to our agenda tonight. Okay. And then next up is the public forum. And what I had asked folks to do, because we want to make sure that we get everybody in and have the availability to, to speak, is we have a list of folks. We have one, two, three, four, five people on the list. Um, what we're, Shireen is actually going to keep the time so that you have four minutes of uninterrupted time to address the police commission. Um, and what Shireen will do is when there's a minute left, she'll just raise her hand, and then when time's up, she'll just raise her hand, okay? Um, we do have five. If anybody feels inspired that's not on the list after the five folks go, please just let us know and um, you can come on up, okay? So the first person is Annie, Annie Mick. It's okay. How do you say it? <laughs> just for the, how do you, how do you say it, Annie? Mac and Annie. Any. No one's ever gotten it. You're totally okay. fine. Shoot. Um, but thank you. Yes. Um, so I just have a few questions um, for the commission. Um, namely, are you still planning on increasing the number of officers in the police force? Are there any plans to cap the totals of numbers of officers? Um, the chief himself, actually, during the city council meeting, stated that it would take a significant number of officers to be converted into social um, social workers to make a significant change in the way that the force runs and the way that our city operates. And are there any plans to hire social workers and social service providers in the place of police officers? So those are my questions. Those are a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. Well, the resolution from city for between before city council yesterday did not get passed. You know that, right? Yes. About social workers, and you know that we do have some social. We have two social two social workers, right, Chief? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, and so we have we we can 99? hire up to a hundred or hundred and forty something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are no plans to do anything differently than what we're currently doing. Okay. Unless, Chief, if you want to respond to that. Yeah, so there's no plan to cap the number of police officers um, any less than our capacity to hire up to 105. Um, we do have two clinical social workers and an epidemiologist employed by the police department. We also work closely with the street outreach team from the Howard Center. I was speaking with Bob Bick this morning about, number one, um, expanding their capacity and also uh, possibly co-locating them at the police department because they're a vital uh, intervention and um, you know de-escalation capacity that we've worked with for years and their staffing we the city contributes to the staffing so does the marketplace so does uh, the Howard Center and it varies from like three to five or four to six but I would like to pursue the opportunity to get it up to uh, to four to six so that they can partner with police officers to do interventions in mental health and homelessness crises out in the community. Well, then I guess I, I suppose, like, if that's not something that you can answer right now, um, I guess I could reframe that question as do police commission, anyone on the police commission see that as like a worthy goal or something worth pursuing? Well, I can, I can answer. I think any time that we can, um, partner with community agencies and provide support to citizens and provide support to police officers who are dealing with all sorts of mental health issues um, in the field, I, I would support that. So. Can I just have a point of, so yes. part of the question I guess is whether this is question and answer moment here for us or are we here to just hear some concerns and then discuss those I don't know I'm not lobbying one way or the other but I'm not sure if I'm clear as to you know they well I think Annie's Annie your your it is usually just public comment oh but, I that's what that's, I assumed I assumed you would have all the public comment and then answer the questions as they came because I know there are other people with questions as well but I figured since you responded to me immediately I may as well clarify the question if you're not able to answer it answer it however it makes sense to so that we can get an answer that we actually understand what's going through the commissioner's brains right now in light of the new information. So, okay. but I can let other people speak as well. If, yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Task force. That's what I should refer to as the task force. Yeah. Who's next? Oh, next on the list is Pierre Dre. 
sorry, he can't read the writing. Deirdre. 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 Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, Deirdre. Uh, yeah, I have a question as well, so for later. Um, for some context, um, the Washington Post published that um, in 2017 of the police shootings, about a tenth were captured by body cam um, footage. And so I wanted to ask if the Burlington Police Department uh, plans to have or does have 100% adoption of uh, body cameras and um, if there are plans for um, guidelines around releasing um, body cam footage to the public. And lastly, um, if body cams body cameras can be meaningful transparency tools um, without timely public release of footage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian Clifford? I think I got that one right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess I have a question as well. Um, this is regarding the recent body cam uh, videos of the arrests of Mobby Orjak and Jeremy Melly. Um, the Burlington Police <coughs> Department use of force policy states that verbal and nonverbal commands should be given to direct and let a subject know what is expected of him or her. I'm um, just wondering uh, if those scenarios should have involved some sort of verbal or nonverbal um, commands and um, kind of what the breakdown there might have been if that is the case. Thank you, Brian. Lauren Kennedy. Um, I have a comment and then a question. Okay. Um, I just wanted to um, clarify in light of the um, resolution that was shot down by City Council um, and the general discussion and response around that, um, that people are asking the, I want to clarify that people are asking um, the police to go against its their own institution and against the cover each other asses like culture in order to justly serve the greater communi community. Um, and that failing to hold officers accountable for crimes is not justice. Um, and it condemns and endangers the community that the police um, serve or are supposed to serve. And while officers may feel demonized and demoralized, um, the community has been feeling demonized and demoralized by the police for many, many years. Um, and the community uh, particularly people of color and homeless people don't have protection from the police um, and that is my comment um, and then the question is on Wednesday May 29th multiple body cam videos were posted to the department's YouTube channel um, why were they posted and why were they promptly taken down Thank That's you. It. Brian Waters. Thanks. I, uh, I thought my statement was short, but I guess it'll be a bit longer than the previous ones. Um, but before I started, I just wanted to acknowledge to the chief uh, that I spoke over you at a city council meeting a few weeks ago. Um, and, but also, this is an acknowledgment and not an apology. Um, uh, and you can take that however you will. Um, but the reason I'm not apologizing is that uh, people in this community are angry. They've been angry for a long time, um, and right now they're speaking out. Um, and, peop and when people are angry, especially when they're angry about uh, physical violence, which is the ultimate form of incivility, um, I think that a little bit of incivility in speech is okay. Um, and I think that if I were to apologize, I think I'd be apologizing on behalf of some really valid feelings within the community. 
Um, so it's an acknowledgement, not an apology. You can take that as you will. <clears throat> anyway, um, the reason I'm here is to bring up something uh, that I haven't heard mentioned publicly, or at least in like a public forum type setting yet, um, <clears throat> uh, which is that a few weeks bef uh, ago, before that very same meeting, uh, the BPD sent three cops to monitor a speak out about racism and police violence that had been uh, organized by Black Lives Matter of Great Greater Burlington and I, I think maybe some other groups. Um, and since this is a public forum, I guess I'll pose my questions as a statement, um, but I'm wondering why the BPD thought that was a necessary step. Um, and for the folks behind the camera, uh, I'll preface this by saying that I'm not a fan personally of terms like community policing uh, and progressive police, um, but for a department that prides itself on those things, um, I don't understand how you thought uh, it would be acceptable or okay to send police to such a speak out. Um, I think you have to put yourself in the shoes of someone who uh, maybe has experienced police violence. Uh, they may have had a traumatic experience with police violence and they might have something to say um, and imagine how much more difficult that might have been um, with three police officers in the back um, sort of monitoring the speak out. So <laughs> thank you. Does anybody else have any comments that they would like to make that's not on the, the sign-up sheet? Anne? I thank you, Michelle, and everyone else for inviting us to be here. I'm Anne Jaroski. I work at the university. Um, and I'm here because I really just kind of wanted to get a, a feel for what this group does, what this group is like. And the reason for that is because I was so disturbed after seeing the video that all of you I know watched, um, and I just could not, fan fa I couldn't imagine how a group of people could vote to say that that was okay, that the, the actions, the punishment um, was okay. And so I'm just trying to f get a feel for how this group works and how a decision like that could be made. So that's what I'm here for, and um, that's, I guess, all I'm gonna say. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Mark, we'll get to you right after. Go ahead, come on up. If you could just say your name too. Um, my name is Kina Thorpe. Um, I was born and raised in Vermont. I'm 24, <laughs> 24 now, so I've lived here for 24 years. Um, and um, like growing up here, I never, felt afraid of police officers um, and I think that that part of part of that might be that I'm biracial and I most of the time was with my white family um, who even though some of that family got into trouble with the police a lot I never saw or heard them um, talk about being having excessive force used against them. And trust me, like some of the people in my family are people who like to not like people for no reason. So were there to be incidences of police brutality used against them, they would have something to say. Um, and so um, I work at the Peace and Justice Center um, and that combined with being a black woman who lives in America, I'm obviously very in tune with the incidences of police brutality that are happening all over the country. Um, and up until a couple months ago when I saw the body cam footage, part of me was still in denial about the fact that something like that could happen here because it didn't match the experience that I'd had um, being sheltered by the whiteness of half of my family. Um, and so, and, and going to the, um, the city council meeting that um, happened a few weeks ago and seeing how when, when prompted by one of the speakers about how many people had seen the body cam footage, how there were a couple of our city councilors who hadn't seen it, um, it really disturbed me. Um, and seeing that compared with some of the comments on 
and I know that social media isn't the best way to gauge <laughs> um, general consensus, um, but seeing the things that people had to say about the incident, about how he deserved it for being drunk and disorderly, which I think a lot of people have been in their life, um, combined with just this, this wall that's been put up between the well, not put up, but that has been there between the police and the people. And just this complete, it just seems like a complete and total lack of empathy for the, for the victims, the di direct victims of these incidences, as well as the people like me who are now terrified or, or have been terrified, who are experiencing the shared trauma. And so I'm just wondering. Just one more minute. Sorry. Just, just asking for for one minute if we can just stop having this discussion as if it's some um, fictional heady thing, and like really get to our hearts and just be honest about the fact that what we saw was horrible and it's impacting people and something needs to be done about it. Because talking, talking to us, um, like reading off a script and being robots is not the way to solve this problem. Like we want to hear honest answers and we want honest solutions and I feel and I think a lot of other people feel like we're not getting that because it's it's easier to read off a script than it is to to come from the heart and be honest so I'm just asking you to do that thank you thank you good evening Hello. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Mark Hughes I'm with Justice for All, <clears throat> and I apologize for being late. I was just over at the uh, nom nominations committee meeting tonight. It looks like you guys have 10 applicants uh, for the uh, commission. Uh, so, um, yeah, I wanted to just have a just make offer a couple of brief uh, comments, Madam uh, Chair, uh, just about the recent events uh, with the um, I guess it was 17 or so students uh, that were asked to get off the school bus over in the <clears throat> old north end. And just wanted to bring out um, just a couple of thoughts on it and, and also uh, leave you with uh, just some um, su suggestion, Brandon. Uh, and I think that, you know, there's so much attention and there's so much time being spent to, you know, having a conversation about whether the kids were naughty or whether whether they, you know, whether they were, you know, deserving of discipline or whether they're, parents should, uh, you know, have uh, done a better job at doing, you know, uh, maybe they just, you know, maybe they needed to be put off the bus or it wasn't um, racism, uh, move along, nothing to see here. Obviously, if, if, uh, if there were white kids that were also removed from the bus while those black kids were removed from the bus, it couldn't possibly have been racism. Um, so there's just, in all of those, I think, are just distractions if we're, going to, if we're going to talk about policing. Because there was a crime that was committed. It seems as if there's a crime that was committed. Uh, because if I took a five-year-old, or a six-year-old, or a seven-year-old, um, <clears throat> and dropped them off in a neighborhood anywhere in town because they were being naughty, or no matter what they looked like, you'd have DCF crawling up my butt. And not only that, I'm sure it'd be a legion of cops standing in line to question me as to what the hell is going on. So I think there's a law enforcement account, a responsibility rather, um, that, you know, and, and here's the other dimension of it, is, is whether there was, you know, white kids involved or not, you know, it just occurred to me that here we are again, just like we were in Bennington, asking the police to prosecute a crime uh, that's, being perpetrated allegedly against at least the vast majority of which are people of color. So here we go again. So we failed to do that in Bennington. Uh, we, we failed to do that. Uh, uh, Erica and Paul uh, did not prosecute a crime. TJ did not prosecute a crime. And what we walked away with out of that was is freedom of speech. Freedom of speech when there were at least three laws on the books that could have been prosecuted. 
And, and and I think what people of color are experiencing, and let, let's just talk about the repercussion of that for a minute. And, I, and I'll, I'm going to just take one more minute, Madam Chair. Okay, repercussion of that is is that it emboldened white supremacists and white folks and folks who would seek to br- uh, cause bring harm to people of color across this entire state, hands down. And what it did is, is it made black and brown people feel less safe. Period. Okay, so. And so what, what that does is it also establishes a precedent, okay, because law enforcement, they, they don't necessarily feel like they have to prosecute these crimes. And, and, and I think a part of the thing, and I'll close here, is, is that this is a part of a larger issue that we have. I don't know whether anybody has looked around lately, but we got a national crisis right now. It's not because things have recently changed, because we've always been a racist nation, but it's, I mean, you know, we got another Woodrow Wilson in the White House. So um, what I'm urging, what I'm asking you to do, Brandon, is prosecute the crime, okay? If there's a crime that's been violated, find it. Get out your book, dust off Title 13. Find out what's going on, who did what, who recklessly endangered those children and why, okay? And prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. That's what I'm asking you to do. So, you know, find Sarah, have a conversation, do your job, Prosecute the crime, lead by example. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <coughs> you all? Um, my name is Yuol Hedjuk, and this question is to anyone um, who has a kid, um, particular to Michelle. Um, you know me, Michelle, for 14 years, and and know me for 14 years. If that was one of your kids, one of your son, do you think that your answer would have been, um, your comments would have been uh, uh, the same as you put them out to the public? Um, and the reason I ask you that is. I'm still struggling how to try to communicate with you because uh, I was very upset and these are the kids that I actually grew up with. Um, and that could have easily been me in the video, without a doubt. And, and I just cannot quite figure out how could someone with the kids look at those videos and, 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 and say that's okay. Um, so. That's, that's my questions. Thank you. Thanks, you all. I think two other people stood up. How do you spell his name? Do you know? Uh, <coughs> you all. Okay. Thanks. My my name is Jennifer Decker, and my um, question or comment is how do we as a community get from police brutality to police accountability? And um, one question that I have in light of that is that we have uh, two police officers who, as far as I understand it, um, may be still on the street. Um, who've made uh, very poor judgments to the point that um, they ought not to be in that role anymore. And I understand that there might be rules and laws and lawsuits and that type of thing that may interfere with people uh, asking those individuals to take responsibility. Um, However, I think that there are some um, avenues in terms of uh, directly holding people accountable that uh, must be pursued. Um, One thing that really concerned me when I was at the uh, City Hall was that um, I was hearing from the leadership some sort of case building around exonerating certain individuals. As well, I was aware that there had been uh, an initial possible attempt to cover up the um, uh, role of uh, individual in the death of Douglas Kilburn, and and that uh, perhaps I don't uh, have all the most up-to-date information about that, but I was not 
clear as to whether those issues were actually resolved. And from my perspective, they weren't resolved to my satisfaction. And I think it is your responsibility as a commission to hold people responsible uh, for their actions. Now, I used to work at the Howard Center, and I'm actually very good at de-escalating conflicts. Um, I do it uh, without any weapons, and I really um, honestly think that one place, if we want to recruit responsible police officers, would be to recruit people with mental health background who've had to de-escalate conflicts um, without weapons and to use their wits. Um, and um, I, I think that um, one of the things I learned in the context of my career as a mental health therapist is that there is a trajectory, a developmental trajectory in regard to how people are willing to take responsibility and be accountable. And um, it's a immature um, perspective to be primarily concerned about whether you're going to be in trouble for what you've done as opposed to being primarily concerned about the impact that you've had on other people. Um, if I had ever hurt a child in my employment at the Howard Center, um, I would have actually voluntarily resigned because I don't think that it is uh, healthy, uh, helpful, or appropriate um, to uh, be in a profession where you cause harm. And so my question is, uh, with the individuals who are still on the street um, terrorizing uh, my community, um, who is holding them accountable? And I think that one thing that's actually very bad for people, whether they're children or whether they're adults, is to pretend that um, they've done good or that they've done well or that they are uh, free from responsibility for the mistakes that they've made. That's not helpful. And I hope that you all see your responsibility in terms of holding people accountable. When you have relationships with those individuals, it's up to you to take steps to put them in a position where they feel that accountability. Does anybody else have any comments they'd like to share? Um, so here's, there's a lot of questions. Um, we can't get to all of them. Um, uh, typically this is just a <coughs> public comment time where we look forward to feedback and, and input from community members. Um, but I would like to share something, and then if any of my other um, commissioners would like to as well. I, I think if I have given comments that have um, contributed to people feeling like I don't care, and you all thank you, I really appreciate it. It takes courage to come and actually say that to me in public, so thank you. Um, or that any of my fellow commissioners don't care, I just want to let you know that it was hard for all of us to watch that. We did spend hours in executive session. It, it's not that anybody thought it was okay or that anybody took anything lightly, including the leadership of the police department. Um, we, for, for whether you agree or don't agree, we did go through a process that I can say I believe had integrity, the process. It was not that anybody thought that it was uh, not to be taken <coughs> seriously or that it was um, that it was okay it, it was hard for everybody and uh, like I said whether you agree or disagree with the outcome the the care and the compassion and the heart were there not only for what happened but mostly how do we not have it happen again um, so that's that's and maybe the chief in his comments wants to address some specific things but from my perspective um, and I and and I want to say from my perspective it is really meaningful and important to me that all of you came up and shared what you shared because it's not easy to share things that you feel like you're you know you might feel vulnerable sharing them um, to us and uh, it's it's meaningful so thank you and I just want to piggyback on that so um, you know one of the things we're struggling with in this is um, that we can't 
speak about the details. So I know someone, you know, there are some questions directed at um, how we could think something in what we saw. And so I gave a public comment at a press conference. And I think when you're talking about ro robotic and not having emotion, it could be me you are talking about. I spent a day prepping that statement because that's not my job. Um, media comments. I was very nervous, but I also was struggling with how can, I, I really want to be able to give as much information, but we have this obligation that we, we can't talk about personnel matters. So that's a, a difficulty for us is struggling with wanting to be transparent, but respecting um, respecting the privacy, the confidentiality obligations with personnel matters. So your your comments are well taken i mean I, I i probably was very robotic giving a public statement but you know we're human and and the nerve i i know that that was extremely nervous and i thought about every word because i wanted to be very accurate and i wanted to convey that um there's you know we wish we could talk about it openly and talk about how do we how have we arrived at recommendations and we're also advisory in nature which i think um, gets lost you know we struggle with what what is our power what do we do as a commission and we're advisory um so you know we have a lot of this is an awkward setting for this discussion but when when we're able to talk about these cases openly it's uh it's much easier for us and believe me if we could talk about the details and and the videos and, and that we would and I know um, one comment about the, the city council not watching the video, Brian Pine actually explained, or one of the commissioners, city councilors did explain that they just, they can't comment during city council. So um, they didn't respond that they had seen the video because it's not their nature in public comment to, to answer questions. So I'm not sure I would say that there were any city councilors at that meeting who didn't watch the videos, just in fairness to them, because I was at that same meeting and I heard the follow up later saying, you know, I didn't raise my hand because that's not what we do. So. And just to speak generally about oversight, you know, we've, the, the city council, many of you may know, a year or so ago charged us to, uh, to follow through with a, a, a new idea of trying to act as an oversight, if you will, to the police department. And, and you know, as the last year that we've tried to figure out the best way to do that, you know, we've, we're finding our own way with respect to that. What's evolved now, I think, is a very positive uh, uh, situation where you have seven citizens who, before any discipline is issued, all right, in many cases, dis discipline gets issued and then there's some oversight at that point, but before <coughs> any dis discipline is issued in this city, the chief will take us into executive session, serious discipline, will show us the evidence, and we'll get the input of seven community members who are trying to do the right thing in this community. All right, and we only see what we see, and sometimes new evidence comes out and people see other things, but based on what we see, we make the best decision we can around guiding this department to make its best decision. And I think with that structure, we do a pretty good job in helping the chief and this department to make good discipline decisions that are consistent and, you know, if you look back to the record uh, of prior disciplines and, and that takes into consideration the community and, and everything else, I mean, we do the best that we can. Is it the best system for, for, for oversight? I think that's a question that is being raised now and was raised the other night with this new, uh, this new resolution that the city has created a task force to look at the whole concept of discipline and uh, the, how this department operates in terms of oversight and what is the best arrangement. So, you know, there's an opportunity out there to take a look at how it works, how it worked here, and how could it work better. And, to, you know, as that, as that commission evolves, it's, a, I think, a six-month charge to come back sometime in November with, you know, recommendations on how we can all do something better than we have in the past. And I think there's always room for improvement. But I think it's also important just to understand that, at, for now at least, these seven commissioners up here, citizens like yourselves, you know, do see the evidence, we do have a, an open and frank discussion about, about what is reasonable and appropriate, and, and we give out the best advice we can. So, I mean, I don't know if that's any consolation to anyone, but that is how it works now. And we're going to have an opportunity to look to see whether that's the best way to do this or whether there are other ways that that can be structured to be, uh, <clears throat> to be more responsive to the community.
Chief? I mean, I'll, I'll actually jump in real quick. I, okay. I thought there was going to comment on there. Um, <clears throat> right. I mean, I, I would not say that, you know, I think that we are doing things perfectly right now. I don't think that, in part because there are outcomes that happen that we collectively in the city doesn't want. So these are outcomes that we don't want to happen. Um, it, I, it would be helpful, I think, if some more information could be given about what the process is, starting from kind of you know, when the commission becomes aware of, of incidents, when our input is solicited, what we can recommend, you know, speaking during obviously not about any specific case, what, what we can recommend and how that gets factored into an ultimate disciplinary decision. I'm not sure that people know what that is right now or how that works. And I think it would be actually good for people to know a little bit more about how that works. But I, I think that we can all do a better job <coughs> because I think that um, there are still outcomes coming out that we don't want. Um, I, I know, so uh, there were a lot of questions. I'm not going to get a chance to, to say anything about all the questions. I'm not going to try, so I apologize for that right now. But I, I do want to say something, a, a, a few quick things in, in light of this with some things that were said, right? So one was about kind of the kind of looking at social workers versus police officers, for example, right? That was the first comment that was made. Um, and also the maybe the last or second to last comment about um, kind of how mental health workers have abilities in training and de escalating incidents. Um, so, yes. um, so Again, and so this right now is my personal opinion, right? I'm not speaking for the commission or anything like that. Um, you know, look, I, I, I think that what we want, ideally, of course, is for officers of BPD to have those skills, to have those de-escalation skills, so whether they are kind of, whether you're hiring a social worker or, or whether you're hiring someone who already has de-escalation training, whether officers are trained in de-escalation tactics. That's what we want to have happen. Right? And, <coughs> You know, and I think that, you know, obviously not just mental health workers have those skills, although they do, you know, high school teachers have those skills. They're trained in de-escalating situations all the time. Right? There are plenty of people in the community that, that kind of are trained in de-escalation. And I think that, you know, officers are also trained in de-escalation, but it might be that those, that, that, that those policies and training and how that happens needs to be looked at again or, or updated. Um, <coughs> the goal, of course, is for any situation where, you know, a situation can be resolved without any force at all, that, the, that we should be finding ways to make that happen. And I think that, you know, any time we have any tools available to us, we should be looking for that goal. So, um, so I mean, that, so that's just to say that when we're offering our opinions about disciplinary matters, and like I said, and I'll, I'll leave it to someone else to talk about how that happens from start to finish, but when we're looking at disciplinary matters, you know, I, I do think that the goal is always how can we make sure that these situations are not happening in the future if they can be avoided. And then the question becomes, what's the way to do that? Um, and sometimes that is a, a, a tricky question, sometimes that's a tricky answer. And sometimes those answers, when they get implemented, take a longer time to implement than just a kind of one second or one day or one week or one month kind of fix. I mean, sometimes they take longer than that. But I, but I do think that that is the goal. And so, you know, and so in, insofar as we're not getting to that goal yet or quickly enough, um, you know, I. I'm happy to apologize to the community for us not getting to that goal as quickly as we would like to do. But I do think that that's the goal. And so the, the question is just what are the means to get there? Okay. Um, next is uh, Chief's report. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I'll take an opportunity to address some of the questions. That would be great, Chief. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thanks for answering those questions. I think they were, they were incisive. Um, I'll try to hit on a few of them. There are some that I will invariably miss. Um, I was writing as I went. Every police officer in the uh, city of Burlington is issued a body camera. Any officer on patrol or conducting enforcement operations or conducting an investigation is expected to wear the body camera and activate it during any substantive interaction with the public, an interview, um, you know, a call for service, uh, an attempted arrest. If you come up and ask them for directions, they're probably not going to activate it. Um, it does capture, not with audio, but with video, the 30 seconds prior. So if something is developing and they, 
hit it all of a sudden. As you've seen on the videos you've watched uh, online, I'm sure it captures the prior 30 seconds as well. So it's a safeguard to capture that information. It's worth noting, for example, that in the cases of um, force that made the news that they were captured on our body cameras and they were turned over to defense attorneys uh, as well as prosecutors. Um, so they're, and, and in both cases, although in for example, the case with Mibi or Jock, it was the officer that took the, uh, uh, that made the arrest and other people came on a few minutes afterwards, but there's often more than one uh, body camera at work. So um, beyond that, you also have folks filming things, which we uh, encourage, that's your First Amendment right. Uh, and like I said, even if you look at the unfortunate uh, shooting of Phil Grennan, for example, that was captured on uh, several different body cameras. So we have 100% saturation and our policy for body camera use is online. You can uh, peruse it, but again, they're expected to be used in every substantive encounter with a, with a, a citizen, uh, all substantive police work, and uh, the officers cannot edit or delete their body camera footage. And once they dock it, it's downloaded, and then it's uh, only supervisors can edit or delete, but they may not, that's against uh, regulation. And it's turned over, like I said, not only to prosecutors, but to defense attorneys. Um, as far as the distribution of body camera footage, there's a Supreme Court case that in Vermont that we're expecting a decision on uh, that will talk about the fees that can or can't be charged. One of the reasons why the city has an interest in that is because it's that decision not only applies to body camera footage, but all documents. And we've had people, I mean, for example, not just whatever your political affiliation is, people on, on the right, people on the left have made very, very, very voluminous uh, fishing expedition uh, public records requests of us, um, sometimes to gather information to use in, in a political nature. And the city wants to understand how the Supreme Court's going to rule about our ability to charge for that before we have to supply, for example, a pro-NRA uh, advocacy group with everything the city's ever said about gun control, for example. Um, we should get some feedback on that soon. But in general, and I stress this, like I, I'm for um, you know, notwithstanding the outcome of this decision, the timely release of, of body camera footage. I think that um, if you look at cities like Seattle, um, cities like New York or DC, for example, it's uh, up to the discretion of city government to release the footage, and it often gets released very quickly. Here, for example, if you look at our prosecutors, uh, in this case, Sarah George, TJ Donovan, um, their uh, precedent is has been um, unremittingly to withhold body camera footage until they've made a charging decision. Uh, I don't always agree with that, and we'll see how that uh, pans out. Um, as far as the use of verbal commands, I think, so right now, that case, these cases are being litigated, but I will say I did a 25-minute press conference where uh, I acknowledged that there is a, a requirement to use verbal commands, if safe to do so, in our policy, and I said a lot about that at the time. It's still up on the Burlington Police Department Facebook page, and I spoke and alluded to, either in, in some certain and some illusory terms, to how I feel about those cases and about the use of verbal commands, and um, how I felt, at least in one case for certain was the basis of discipline. Um, so that is a valid point that you made and I won't uh, contest it. In fact, I, in great substance, I agree with it. Um, as far as uh, Mr. Waters, I, if you recall, I, I wasn't upset that you, I said as much, I wasn't upset you interrupted me. Um, I was more concerned that, that what you said was, was, was a factual error. You said that our crisis intervention truck has a grenade launcher on it um, that shoots foam, Darts. It's a less than lethal device. So I went back and I checked. I said, maybe you know something I don't. Maybe they opened up one of the hatches and you were filming something. I said, do we own anything that explodes or irritates or has any sort of like a chemical weapon or pepper spray or tear gas or an explosive that's fired out of that? And the answer is unequivocally no. So please feel free to interrupt me. I, I just prefer that the, like, the, the, I mean, we can contest the facts. I just, I'm less likely to take umbrage at facts that I, I believe are true when I, and I get interrupted. Um, as far as the policing of protests go, um, I'm assuming you're talking about the, the speak out that was on Church Street. Um, so I understand why you feel that having a few police officers present may have a chilling effect of some sort. A lot of people feel that way. Um, we take seriously two things. One is the uh, absolute, 
uh, need to, to protect and facilitate protests. You may not take that at face value. I don't take Charlottesville, Virginia at face value. I don't think that extremists won't come to a protest in Burlington and take their umbrage out at the far right or the far left or anything like that. Um, I felt that if a protest happens and anyone gets hurt, someone could just walk up to a protester and, and, and sucker punch them, for example, let alone drive a car or shoot into the crowd. I'd feel like we haven't done our job as a police department uh, if we haven't um, you know, police protest. What I'm not going to do is put plainclothes officers into a protest. I think that's deceitful. Um, so what we do do is put a small number of uniformed officers around a protest, people who tend to be more aligned with us. And I don't just mean politically, but it wasn't an issue, for example, when we had the uh, um, uh, the Pulse nightclub rally and speak out on the other side of City Hall Park. People, it's a different theme, but people weren't upset at the, at the protection. In fact, they, they liked it. I'm sorry if you felt um, like it was... Unwelcome. But the other thing is where you decide to do to, to, to do a march, what we have a history of is in especially with police brutality, and we discussed this. If you're if you're alleging criticism of the police department and you decide to do a march, I'm inclined, whether you have a permit or not, to facilitate that march uh, rather than make an arrest. And we did something very similar to that, for example, Black Lives Matter up at UVM. If you're gonna start marching into the street, for example, and shutting down Main Street, like we need police officers there to facilitate that. So if you'd ever like to make sure that you're having a, a protest uh, and you want to make sure that police are I, I'm gonna insist that if at all possible, police are there to make sure it's safe. But if you want to make sure that it has an impact that, that doesn't feel like it's chilling, I'd be happy to work that out, uh, you know, in advance so that we can come to a, a um, consensus or, you know, a compromise about that. Um, Mr. Hughes, as far as Bennington goes, I mean, I share your frustrations with the prosecution or lack thereof. I assume you're talking about Kia Morris. If you're talking about prosecution, as you know, we have made hate crime prosecutions in this city that sometimes have been um, number one, overturned sometimes that actually the ACLU has come out against and said, you guys too vigorously prosecute hate crimes and we're going to fight to free the defendant. So if you're talking about our willingness to tackle difficult racial issues, the proof lies in uh, the prosecution, as I've said, of a person who distributed KKK flyers to people of color, um, the prosecution of Christopher Hayden. We opened up a hate crime investigation into the burning of the, uh, the pride flag on Bright Street. Um, you know, if you read the comment section, people are saying, you just, they criticize us for that. I don't, uh, uh, I, I don't take that seriously. I think we're doing the right thing. In the case of the children with the bus, we, the key thing you said was, was prosecution. Prosecution is a joint decision between uh, myself and uh, the state's attorney. As you know, the state's attorney is clear that she does not bring cases that she doesn't think she could win in good faith. I have been in discussions with her about the feasibility of a case here. I don't have an answer for you, but... Uh, I will check back and, and, uh, and, and give you an update. Um, as far as people with mental health uh, backgrounds in going into policing, I completely agree that that's the, the type of people that we'd actually want to be police officers who have um, experience working with people in crisis and experience in de-escalation who are joining uh, the police department, not for like a misplaced sense of adventure, but because they, they have a sense of dealing with these at-risk communities and they're willing to help. Um, I, I work closely with the Howard Center. Um, I have the privilege of being on the board. I remind Bob Bick that the police department, uh, you may disagree with this in spirit, but it pays better than the Howard Center. So uh, if anybody wants to join the police department with the crisis intervention background in mental health, I'd love uh, to have them apply. Um, I just wanna see if I'm missing one or two other things. Um, no, I mean, I guess that's, that's all that I see here. I'm probably, oh. No, I think another thing, too, that I want to be candid about is I don't agree. Uh, I'm not satisfied with the timeline at which we uh, release the information about these two use of force incidents, uh, because, number one, uh, we didn't decide to release them, right? They were released by the plaintiff. The plaintiff got the body camera footage. Uh, the plaintiff's attorney wrote a, a civil complaint and released it. Um, you know, we felt we were looking at these issues at least going as far back as uh, October to November, like right when I got back uh, to work after being out with my injuries. And we had many, many, many sessions where we're saying this is something that, um, you know, needs to be released quickly because it's going to look like um, we were withholding if we didn't. But we knew that the day was coming and we knew that these were disturbing um, uh, images and we knew that we'd have to account for them. And one of the things that I hope that really comes from the task force and the committee that's being formed is uh, an understanding about when to release sensitive, high-impact personnel matters 
um, that will have an effect on public trust that deviates from the city's present personnel policies. Because the city's present policies are unequivocal about the fact that personnel matters are quiet, they're confidential, um, and, and even after they're resolved, they don't normally get advertised. I don't agree with that. And to my relief, even our union said, no, listen, we need to release these things uh, sooner. So if there's one or two things, I guess, that I'd, for certain that I'd like to come, or three, one, just hitting on a few things, I think it'll be cheaper, easier, and quicker to redact body camera footage than ever before. I think it gets cheaper every day. I think that we can tend towards uh, more timely releases. Somebody asked about the stuff that was put on Reddit, uh, not Reddit, it made it right onto Reddit, put out and and taken down. That was body camera footage that was being prepared uh, for a transmittal to a family member of a person who'd asked for it. Um, the press has since inquired about it. I assume that that footage will now become a matter of, of public discussion soon. But that was actually put up very, very briefly in error. That was a complete uh, clerical error on our part that was supposed to be transmitted to somebody who was involved in that incident. So better release of footage, number one. Um, cheaper, faster, uh, maybe telling prosecutors that in high stakes incidents it's better to get the footage out there rather than wait months to put it out. Um, I would prefer if the Douglas Kilburn footage was out in public right now and I made that clear to, uh, to everybody. Um, number two, I think it would be great to have a better expectation of when we can deviate from present personnel precedent in order to release uh, these notifications and footage about high impact incidents. And number three, I think it would be great to come up with an apparatus by which it's not uh, an additional duty for the police department to investigate things like civilian complaints and also see if we ought to hire out investigators or not, but to have a more uh, permanent investigatory apparatus that specializes in it, that maybe works at our collective direction, um, maybe like reports to me on a daily basis, but then answers to the police commission. So I think there's a lot of good opportunities with this committee to bring more like speed and transparency and fairness to the, uh, um, the disciplinary process. So that's kind of a snap. There was a lot of different things that were brought up in these comments, but that's where we're at with, uh, with most of them. Thank you. Chief. <coughs> oh, um, chief's update. All right, so not in any sort of uh, order of importance, but uh, by way of, um, Good news, we had five graduates just graduate from the police academy. We had a sixth. We had a, a, a foreign-born Sri Lankan New Yorker who came up here to be a police officer. He chose Vermont because it was one of the few places. We are one of the few jurisdictions that will hire permanent residents rather than U.S. citizens. I think it's fantastic. Uh, you know, my father was drafted into the Army before he was a citizen and served this country in uniform. I think if you're willing to make the commitment, we ought to take you. So we get permanent residents who apply to us, and he applied to us because he couldn't get the job in New York. I was very pleased to have him. After a few weeks at the police academy, he decided that uh, the Vermont police scene wasn't for him. So we lost one of our graduates. However, um, we do have five other graduates. They are two women, three men, um, one Asian, two Hispanics. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a good class as far as uh, um, diversity goes. I think we're always striving to um, recruit a diverse class as possible. However, um, we suffer from the same challenges that Vermont suffers when it comes to encouraging people to pick up a life somewhere else where they're more comfortable perhaps, move to Vermont, uh, and join, of all things, the police department, which is a very challenging profession for anybody relocating here. Um, we will be sometime in the next few weeks to months, depending on our schedule, because we have the same person doing most of this, the same two people, which is Nancy Stetson, our analyst, and Eric Craddeville, uh, be releasing our first look at car stop data, as well as the raw data. I'm pointing to Professor Seguino, uh, who has an acute interest in that. Uh, we will also be releasing uh, use of force data. One thing to clarify, it's come out in um, the city council uh, more than once that uh, someone was said it's 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 you, you're legally uh, we are legally obligated to collect uh, car stop race data and analyze it and also hand it over to the government and to the public. Uh, someone said I think it was Max Tracy he said in an error it was inadvertent he said you're legally required to to collect use of force data why why aren't you releasing it. Um, we're not, actually. There's no law in Vermont that requires the collection of use of force data. We do it. The state police do it. Other agencies do it. Um, I'm not saying it's not a legal requirement, so, you know, ha-ha. Um, I'm saying that it is something that's supererogatory. It's one of many things we do. Um, we've been collecting it since 2012 when we started a program, literally a computer program, to do it. We released 2012 to 2016. Uh, in an analysis all at once. I know you were citing a bit of that yesterday, I believe, uh, Professor Seguino. Uh, we will be looking at 17 and 18 uh, in short order, and we will be re releasing the, uh, 
the raw data. Um, there's just one other thing to say by way of notification. Uh, in the last two years, there were two very notable homicides that uh, a decision was made on today. One was Aida Garong uh, hacked his wife's head open and killed her uh, in public on Hyde Street uh, about a year and change ago, um, if the date is correct. We were able, although he was you know, menacing folks with that cleaver, and although he'd injured um, um, his victim's mother-in-law, we were able to take him into custody. He was charged with murder, and Mr. Fortier stabbed somebody in the throat and killed him on a, a Church Street uh, in the middle of the day as well. So both of these folks had defense attorneys who pled insanity. Today, uh, the state's attorney has notified the public that uh, she will not be prosecuting these cases, and uh, all the charges against these individuals are dismissed. Um, so by way of public notification, um, we are advocating that before anybody contemplates returning either Mr. Forte or Mr. Garong to the community, that they uh, receive the psychiatric evaluation that hopefully uh, will leave them institutionalized until there can be absolutely no doubt that they're not a threat to uh, others or the public. Because what we have here are two crimes, one with a cleaver, one with a knife, that resulted in uh, homicides. Uh, and again, to, re to reiterate, both of these incidents uh, will not be prosecuted by the state's attorney because she feels the case cannot be made by reason of insanity. So we will be following the proceedings at the Department of Mental Health uh, to see if these people will remain institutionalized or if they'll be returned to the public. But I did want to let uh, folks know, and I guess it's also saying that, like, you know, we, we have a very, very robust mental health apparatus uh, in, in our community. Um, both of these individuals were mental health patients uh, in our community, both at the hospital and the Howard Center. Uh, the Howard Center's budget is about $110 million for its services, which are all high need services. Um, the hospital and the community health center of Burlington, their psychiatric and mental health budgets run into the millions. They vastly outpace our budget and the mass of their social workers vastly outpaces our, our staffing uh, as police officers. But we do respond to uh, mental health crises that, that uh, oftentimes, candidly, mental health workers are either unable to safely respond to or just can't. And I think not only should we ensure that the community is not in danger uh, by Mr. Garong or Mr. Fortier if we talk about whether they should be institutionalized or released, but a lot of times mental health crises come to a violent uh, um, conclusion that, that, that in, like requires the intervention of the police and sometimes requires force. And I think that these decline prosecutions are a reminder of the fact that crime and mental health are different, but they can both be violent, and sometimes the police response is something different than a, a mental health crisis response. So, thank you. Thank you uh, do any commissioners have any questions for Chief Del Pozo? No. Okay. Um, next on the agenda, update on proposed, which is not, not proposed, it's uh, um, it's actually, we can do an update on the task force um, <coughs> regarding um, use of force and, you know, really looking at uh, Burlington policing. It was approved last night, um, and what, what I need to do, according to the resolution, um, commissioners, is appoint <coughs> two people who are interested in serving on this task force. It will be a commitment. Um, you know, it was sent out uh, for you guys to take a look at and read. And I guess my question is, um, is anybody, um, <coughs> excuse me, any commissioner, do any commissioners feel inspired to uh, be part of that task force? We need, and I need to we, point to. Should we give, give us some time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be interested. And Randall? Yes. Okay, if he's interested. Okay, great. Anybody else want to be considered? Did you um, have a question? Uh, no, no, that's good. Thanks, Jay. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll put forth both of your names um, to uh, City Council. Okay. Um, you know, we have been thinking about how, what would the role of the police commission be while the task force is going, you know, is, is happening. And um, I think one of the things that I envision, and if anyone else has any other thoughts, is that the two of you would be part of the task force and would give agenda items for us to consider and give you input as commissioners to bring back to the task force and for you to keep us updated on what's going on. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any thoughts about that? No? 
Okay. Uh, the <coughs> next is arraignment data. Laura, are we able to get this working? Should we move our seats? Yeah, sure. We're gonna, if not, we'll be making bunnies. So by, I guess by way of introduction and maybe to buy, are you ready to go with that or is it? Okay, the wheel's spinning. We have like a two gigabyte RAM on that. Um, yeah, sure. So um, maybe to buy audio, the audio video squad, maybe to buy folks some time. Um, one of the things that we mentioned we would be doing in the coming weeks was uh, talking about our collection of arraignment data. Um, I didn't want it, listen, there was a lot more pressing stuff to get out uh, in public over the last few weeks, and they didn't want it to just get lost in the shuffle, but I think this is an important project that we've been working on for uh, the last 20 months, and I'm, I'm actually glad that there's an audience of uh, civic-minded and justice-minded people here to at least look at the report. We'll be posting it up. We'll also be releasing the uh, the raw data uh, for other folks to use in the coming uh, days. I know, um, just looking at Liam Connors, we'd spoken about this report. It was very gracious of you not to just constantly FOIA our work in progress, but now you can just get the entire uh, data set uh, right now. Yep, yep, you got it. Um, but what we did is we realized that, you know, we're required, for example, to collect car stop race data. We do collect, obviously, our arrest data. We collect the demographics about it. We know who we're charging. Uh, you know, with various um, crimes. We know what we bring to the prosecutor. And then we know to some extent, and I know that um, um, Mark Hughes gave me a cockeyed look when I, Mark, you here? Or is it like, he gave me a cockeyed look when he said, I said, we basically know who ends up in, in prison for the most part. And he said, well, maybe we kind of do, but we're not exactly sure. But there's also the, the judicial process has a big impact on criminal justice, uh, just the spirit of criminal justice and the disparate impacts by, by race and class. And we realized that there was not a systemic way to look at what happened uh, after we made our arrests and to see, for example, what happened just to begin with at arraignments. So we have a woman who is a victim's advocate who attends uh, every arraignment. And so what we did was we started systematically using her presence to collect uh, data. I know you'll be able to talk about the, um, is it, um, do, I need, do I need to buy more time? The uh, the types of data, but what we ended up doing uh, in any case was uh, over the last 20 months, we kept on refreshing the report, but we, we took comprehensive data from the last 1,000, I guess at this point, 1,787 Burlington arraignments. So every time we leveled charges and every time there was a subsequent arraignment, uh, we had somebody at court, we may have missed a few, but we have one basically 1,800 incidents. Um, we collected the uh, the age of the defendant, the gender of the defendant, the race of the defendant, the charge, the judge, um, whether the person showed up, whether bail was set, how much was set, whether a warrant was issued, um, what the incident number was, and maybe even a few other things are, are missing. Uh, and then we looked at some, uh, we ran it through some statistical batteries. So um, looks like PowerPoint is not responding. There we go. So that having been said, um, Nancy Stetson is our um, crime and data analyst. Nancy comes to us originally from Vermont, but educated by way of uh, Berkeley out on the West Coast in public, public policy or public administration? Public policy. Public policy. Uh, so she is the author of this report, and I wanted to give her the opportunity to uh, present some of it. Just as long as folks can hear you, I think that's that's fine. Uh, okay, so uh, like what you said, we were looking at um, trying. We were trying to figure out how much bail people are given and what percent of cases in Jenny County actually get any bail. And we found that there wasn't great public information about this. Um, the it, arraignment is a public hearing, but there's not like transparency data from the from the courts um, that you can look at for all cases so because we had someone sitting in the courtroom uh, she just started collecting 
uh, who was arraigned and how much bail they got. So this covered 20 months uh, since September 2017. There were over a thousand defendants and like the chief said, around 1,800 cases. And about a third, a little less than a third of those cases were on, there was a charge that included a felony. Uh, so what we found was that of all the cases, around a fifth of them actually received some bail. Uh, bail was generally pretty low. And you can see the chart just shows um, the frequency of the amount of bail that was given. I don't know. Yeah, um, if folks can't see the, well, I don't know what to say if folks can't see, but maybe you can okay. highlight some of the. Well, so um, the highest mark there is uh, $50,000. There were uh, two, over this period, there were two people that received bails of uh, a quarter million dollars, but that was quite rare and, and an outlier, I felt. Um, but for the most part, bails were under $5,000, and most uh, were under $500. $500 was the median uh, bail. Um, we also found that a number of uh, defendants did not show for their uh, bail hearings. Around one out of every five defendants that were called to arraignment were not actually present for it. Uh, and so then the judge either issued a bench warrant or I guess an arrest warrant is also possible in that case. Um, so that was, was surprising to me. So um, one of the things that courts do uh, or just, you know, People who, sometimes defense attorneys, but sometimes cities, it's at different levels, different municipalities, but they either give a, a, a phone reminder or email reminder or text reminder about showing up to, uh, to your bail or arraignment hearing in order to reduce uh, the incidence of people not appearing. Not appearing will either get you bail and or a warrant, so it has cascading effects on uh, people's lives. And we found that in uh, Chittenden County, for our cases, like I said, 20 people, 20% of all people scheduled for arraignment just never show up. Um, and also there were a number of defendants who were arraigned multiple times in this in this period. One the defendant was arraigned fifteen times over that twenty month period. Um, that was that was the most of any defendant. But you can see that the the judges did see the same defendants repeatedly. That did make up the bulk of their work. So, like the chief said, we did look at the demographics of bail. Uh, you can see that men and women were given about the same amount of bail. Um, women were slightly less likely to receive any bail. Um, but bail is closely, whether someone receives bail, it's closely um, correlated with whether they're, like how severe the charge was. <coughs> So felony cases were more likely to receive bail than misdemeanor cases, so that um, is connected. And um, as far as race goes, we found that uh, African American defendants were more likely to receive bail and also uh, had higher bail set. But both of those results um, did not hold when you controlled for the severity of the charge that they had. We also wanted to look at uh, whether judges um, assign bail differently, because judges have a, pretty, a fairly wide latitude on whether they need to assign bail and how much bail to actually put on. Um, we didn't, I, I was actually surprised that we didn't find a bigger difference between them. There, as you can see, there's some variation. This only includes judges which, with at least uh, 20 cases over this time period. Um, and they all um, assign bail in about one out of every four or one out of every five cases. This analysis also looked at whether the bail reform law that went into effect last July had an effect on the level of bail set. So uh, it, the bail reform had a number of pieces. The, the part I'm going to focus on is this cap on bail, so the act said that judges can only assign bail to $200 for any charge that is a misdemeanor that is expungible, which are generally just non-violent, low-level offenses. Um, and what I found was that 
the the law seemed to work in those cases that uh, the bail was limited to $200 for low-level misdemeanors, but it didn't have a wider effect, or at least a large wider effect, on other types of offenses. It didn't seem to bring down bail or cause less bail to be assigned for more severe cases. Uh, and this, this chart uh, shows that same um, distribution. So the, the red box plots are uh, the more severe cases, and the blue are these expungeable misdemeanor cases. Um, you can see how bail was limited, the average bail went down, um, but not so much for the more severe cases. And Chief, those are all my slides. Thanks. So, um, you know, one of the things that's important to stress, I guess there's a few things, and if you have any questions, we'll be happy to take them, but um, there doesn't exist a data set like this uh, anywhere else in Vermont, um, but we thought it was important to construct one just to see the next step in um, the criminal justice system. It would be interesting to look at the effects of plea bargaining. It would be interesting to look at the effects of sentencing. Uh, we don't have as much insight into those things because we're not usually physically present in the courtroom for that stuff. Um, but what this shows us, if you're interested in cash bail reform, this data set will enable you to look at uh, the trends in cash bail, the effects of cash bail, how much cash bail is set. Uh, if you're interested in looking at individual judge behavior, though we do anonymize the judges, you can tease that apart uh, if you get your hands on the data set. We also, um, like alluded to, looked at um, whether somebody shows up to court or not. I think it's, if we're looking at a negative effect about the issuance of a warrant or the issuance of conditions, uh, if one in five people don't show up to court, that pretty much always follows with a sanction of some sort. So if you could increase uh, the, just the simple presence of people in court, judges are then disinclined to subsequently give bail, They're usually likely to let people continue to appear on their own accord. So any system that helps get that extra 20% to the courtroom will probably reduce uh, you know, negative impacts in the arraignment process. Um, and I know there's a, you did a, re in a, a regression analysis, but I don't know if you have any insight from that, or you just skipped it. Oh, I spoke to it a little bit. Just that um, neither race nor gender were significant when you controlled for the severity of the, the charge. Um, well, good point. So anyway, um, that said, this report will be published online. Uh, the report has already been sent to the Chittenden County judges, it's been sent to the prosecutors and the attorneys, uh, and the raw data set will be online as well. So if you are a professor or a student or just curious and you want this data set, uh, it will be there for you. And it's a, it's a very robust set. It's got 1,800 cases and each of them has, how many columns would you say? Uh, well, it, I mean, like 10. 10 columns, 1,800 cases, so it's a, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of data. Um, so, yeah, please, go ahead. Um, I just, uh, just take exception to the idea that $500 bail is not high, um, given the population of people that I've worked with, and I think it would be um, increase the validity of what you're looking at if you also looked at household income um, and class status, because I think a lot of people um, feel very targeted by the police uh, based on class as well as race, and I don't think you can really exclude that, and I think that in my experience with people that have had police involvement, that a lot of times they um, can't make it to those hearings because of factors related to their economic status, like not having transportation, um, and I think that, it, that those factors contribute greatly to systemic injustice and need to be very closely examined. Yeah, that, that's fair, and also part of that act that went into effect last summer um, required judges to um, assess a defendant's financial ability before assignment. Right, so to reiterate, these are the judges setting the bail, and if you feel you know, uh, that 500 is too high, which, which, you know, will be for many people. I mean, that the whole point of our data collection is to show exactly in 1,800 cases how much bail was issued for what type of charge to whom and by what amount. Um, I don't think we could get um, uh, income data for the individual defendants, but, you know, this data sets out there for somebody to take it and, and make the case, for example, that the bail is, is, uh, is too high even after the Bail Reform Act. 
And it also speaks to the incentives of getting people to court, please. I'm curious about the plan for the police department to examine the disparity Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that, that, that I foresaw is exactly that question. Like, why, what I'd be interested in is, you know, what, what separates, I mean, certain cases are plainly always going to be a felony. If you're accused of a robbery, that's a felony, right? But there are cases where there's the same type of crime can be described by a misdemeanor or a felony. So I think the more interesting question is, uh, are officers fairly choosing to charge felony assault versus misdemeanor assault? Are they fairly choosing to charge like the felony version of a few different types of crimes uh, rather than misdemeanors? And then there's the larger question of like, what directs an officer's attention towards a particular person or a particular neighborhood? And so that's like, I'm acknowledging that, right? We can get into like a very deep conversation about that now. Um, I would say that if somebody says that person robbed me, and we do believe that that's true, they are going to get charged with a felony. If someone says, I was burglarized, and we find a fingerprint or a piece of DNA on a, a, um, you know, a window, and it comes back to a person, that person will be charged with felony burglary, right? But there are cases where an officer can give a warning or charge something like disorderly conduct. There are cases where order, officers can charge disorderly conduct or assault, misdemeanor assault or felony assault. And I think that I'm kind of just trying to refine uh, your question, and, and, and it, it would be interesting to look at our arrest data and see what trends prevail there. So, so do you have plans to do that? Well, we put our, I mean, part of it will probably be looking at uh, our use of force data will lead us towards questions like that uh, as well, right? The arrest data is online. Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. Um, the officer may make a charge, but is it the prosecutor? who makes that the actual decision at the arraignment, how is that process? No, that's a great point. Um, I don't know if there's any people, I mean, I made plenty of arrests, but there are, we have folks in the room who are fresh off the, uh, the street. I don't know if you want to explain the arrest and charging process. Yeah, so it's, um, you, you can identify yourself. Yeah. I'm Lieutenant Watson, I'm one of the uh, patrol lieutenants that I'm currently supervising daytime operations. <clears throat> but the officer will take complaint whether or not there is a probable cause to charge this incident. The officer will put together a court packet based on the allegations and the evidence that they have dealt with them. That is then in turn submitted to the prosecutor <coughs> to evaluate our case, evaluate witness statements, uh, and whether or not to determine whether or not they want to proceed with any kind of criminal, criminal charge. So at that point, they can either dismiss or continue on a charge. Or if they feel that there's other factors or evidence that <coughs> would lead them to charge a different criminal offense, they can also do that. Uh, they can send the case back to us for an investigation as well. Um, or they could also combine some of the cases that they currently have if there is someone who's a multiple offender who has current cases pending. Uh, so ultimately, those steps, again, not to simplify it, but that is basically the general steps uh, in the process of getting a citation to court. So the prosecutor will, um, I mean, and I know Deputy Chief Mira to talk about this, they will make charging decisions that really depart from the officer's estimate sometimes. Um, I don't know if you want to share any of that insight, but they do, it's not just, the officer does not decide unilaterally what goes on in arraignment, right? They supply the affidavit and the evidence, and then the uh, attorney makes a charging decision. We do. We have instances of, of public disorder where officers are able to articulate uh, instance, incidents in which the public is put in alarm, and we will have disagreements with uh, our partners in the state's attorney's office about whether or not that alarm rose to certain levels. Uh, an incident in which a man was walking through uh, Church Street and the farmer's market with a knife in his hand and bleeding and shouting, uh, unintelligible things, even, even leaving over a baby carriage at one point with that knife and shouting, uh, and that was held not to be disorderly conduct, um, uh, although the, an arrest was made for disorderly conduct. There are times where uh, charges will be uh, either minimized or will be, as the lieutenant said, rolled into cases where we have instances in which a person is arrested and that individual has so many other cases ongoing 
that uh, the <coughs> state's attorney will say we're not going to move forward with these charges because there are so many others already on the table against this individual. Um, uh, so there are a lot of different outcomes that can happen at the arraignment stage. So one of the things I say unequivocally is we don't track and analyze uh, officer arrest quantity. Um, you know, we'll take an occasional, like, one over the world look, or we'll publish arrests basically with metadata. But I came from a police department where every month I had to give a list to my supervisors of how many arrests I made, felony, misdemeanor, how many tickets I wrote. Um, and, you know, um, they knew anyway because it was all in the system, but they wanted it consolidated for me, too. I know Deputy Chief Murad came from the same police department. Here we don't do that. So it's important to stress that there's not like a tally sheet that we're looking at where officers are incentivized to upcharge to a felony because they get more, uh, you know, credit for it or something like that. I mean, I'm looking even Eric is a police corporal here. You could probably attest to that as well. Yeah, and people talk about quotas um, being an incentive. Uh, you know, that, that's not something that's done here. So. I don't know if, I mean. Yeah, you know, back over, over a year, I've been in the world for over 20 years, and through my tenure, we've <coughs> seen accounts of officers wanting to perform and showing the numbers, and in uh, and, and, and a meaning of positive. They, they were uh, early in their careers, they're more motivated to do certain uh, aspects of policing and uh, would tend to take assignments in areas that were of higher crime volume or higher occupancy of people, which tend to be more active and more, uh, more interaction. So you tend to see officers may have some skewed numbers that way, uh, opposed to someone who is working a daytime shift in the summertime in the New York area where it's uh, less busy because of the dynamics of that area. Uh, so you do see some skewed numbers of that when you look at it that way. But as a supervisor, when I was evaluating teams as a sergeant to now, when I look at the uh, <coughs> totality of our patrol districts and what our, what our people are doing uh, on crime prevention, uh, it, we do tend to see uh, we're not focusing, my team sergeants aren't focusing on the number of incidents officers are responding to or arrested and presenting. It's more about the quality of the investigations and the effect it has on the uh, totality of the community uh, versus, like I said, uh, just putting out numbers to get numbers. There's no value in that if it's not if it's being done maliciously or done without a purpose. So it's hard to use crime. We have a number of officers currently stationed uh, on foot, uh, regular foot patrol in the Lower Church Street area and in the vicinity of City Hall Park. And if they could work the entire summer without writing a single ticket or making a single arrest, that would be great. If their presence alone were enough to dissuade the disorder that I think everybody knows has uh, sometimes been uh, apparent in City Hall Park or in some of those other areas, that would be great. It's not always the case. The city council gave uh, new criminal tickets, uh, created new criminal tickets to be used for individuals whose uh, encounters with civil tickets have not dissuaded them from continued disorderly behavior. That's a, a fact of, of life, but if there were uh, abilities to make all of that uh, be addressed and corrected via mere presence, that would be great. There's no need for the department to push for those kinds of, of, of metrics. They push for it, we push for it, I push for outcomes. I think I just wanted to close with, um, unless anyone has any problems. Sure, sure, just one. Um, oh, please, go ahead. No, I may not be in context. Why don't I was going to ask questions about the actual data and what, okay. it, what it meant to you. So. Sure. Um, please go ahead. I'm sorry, you had a question. Um, so I just noticed at one point in the data, it does say that like about like 25 percent of cases are felonies. Does that seem about right? Not all felonies are violent. If if not all incidents involve violence, and certainly not all involve guns, and certainly not all right. involve weapons, just trying to bring it back, bring the conversation back to why so many people showed up tonight. Um, why can't the percentage of officers? versus social workers reflect the actual percentage of incidents that involve violence and involve weapons and involve a need for an actual armed officer? So, no, that's a good question, and I think that it would be helpful to talk about what it takes to staff a police department and make sure that it's it's well-equipped and well-trained. Um, you know, we have something like 98 officers right now. Um, we have school resource officers. We have um, 
detectives, we have a narcotics unit, um, we have patrol officers, um, we have two community affairs officers, we have uh, a policy analyst, we have a um, uh, domestic violence officer that just deals with domestic violence. When you look at our ability to deploy officers out on the street, um, it's not like we're just overflowing with officers. You'd be surprised to know, or maybe not, or maybe you'd like it, but on a, a Saturday night or even like a, a Wednesday night, there may, be, there may be six officers working in the entire city. So it's not necessarily like uh, we're totally flush with officers. And we have to balance it, but we do need, if a critical incident happens, right, if, if um, if somebody is shot on North Willard Street, like I can't just materialize. I need eight, 10, a dozen officers to secure crime scenes, start doing a citywide canvas for the suspect, um, go take victims to the hospital. And you know, those officers need to be armed. So one of the things we, we can't do is just assume, and God forbid there's ever something like a school shooting or a critical incident, or even just successfully managing the uh, the spontaneous Black Lives Matter protest up on uh, Main Street, just to shut down Main Street that way took uh, eight or 10 officers. So um, we don't always say that we need the maximum amount of officers for um, like every sort of horrible um, crisis, but um, I don't think that we're overstaffed right now. I just think that we're basically staffed. And so where you and I might differ is in um, not in the need to have more uh, of a, of a like social work capacity here, but I don't believe in the zero sum of it coming out of my officer headcount. We might just disagree about that. We staff um, the airport too, sir. Yes, oh yeah, we also send uh, nine officers to, the FAA requires that we staff the airport in order for it to run, so about 10% of our police department just polices the airport. That's another, thank you, John, that's another um, point too. Um, and I would like police officers to be frankly, as well trained as possible in de-escalation and in social work type skills. You may argue they'll never do it as well as a social worker. I might agree. Social workers will never police as well as cops, right? And I, I think, uh, you know, we can talk about resource allocation, but we're not like just falling over with excess cops uh, right now. So thank you for that question, though. Commissioner Simpson, you had a... Well, I just, um, it sounds to me from, if you have one, one out of five people not showing up for arraignment, and you have uh, 339 multiple arraignments and one person arraigned 15 times. <coughs> I think people should know that that's, that's not good and that's, that's a, it's, at least from my perspective, is a, is a breakdown in the, in the system and it's not attributable to the police department, it's attributable to the, to the, to the courts uh, or the state's attorney's office. And so I, I wondered, uh, first of all, do you think that uh, have you sp spoken to anyone to see whether one in five is the people at the court system, for instance, consider that, or the state's attorney consider that ac acceptable? Yeah, so one of the things is that, the, so, I mean, listen, that's a great, you would not be surprised that the chief of police says that the people not showing up to court is a bad thing, right? I didn't want to just say, like, you know, that's, hey, shocker, like, you know, newsflash, the chief thinks everybody should show up to court. But I did want to put that out there. Um, for people to consider, but be a little bit agnostic about what that might indicate. Um, you know, people can draw their own conclusions. But I will say this, right? It's it's not 20% of the people not showing up is, in my opinion, it's disruptive to the judge, it's disruptive to the defense attorneys, and it's disruptive to the prosecutors. It's like literally 20% false starts. Um, and so I think that there are consequences to people not showing up, not just only for the negative downstream effects of a warrant or subsequent bail, but for the efficiency of the court system, their ability to do their job. Um, I don't know how that compares to other places in Vermont. Um, I know that that is in, in, you know, in, in big cities, arraignment is upon arrest. So you are physically transported to arraignment. So there's, unless you're given a desk appearance ticket, you, you're pretty much always getting brought there. Here we give people time, we're more lenient about that, and it does have this 20% uh, no-show rate. I think if the public wants to weigh in on that or the court wants to weigh in on that, they, they ought to. Uh, don't take it from the, don't be surprised if the police think that that's a, too high of an of a, of a absentee uh, rate. Um, but I think that's a, um, no, I think, I think that's a good point. There's one other point I was going to make, and it's going to come to me the second I, uh, that basically agrees with what you're saying. The other, is with respect to the multiple uh, arraignments and a person being arraigned 15 times, that's got to be a, a problem with either who sets the conditions of release or whether the state's attorney is asking for appropriate conditions of release, including cash bail. 
Well, one of the things I was going to say is that one of our biggest arrests is for violating conditions of release. So conditions of release, in lieu of bail, you get sent uh, to go on your own devices, but you may have, um, you know, if there's a domestic violence incident or you can't go near this person, you're accused of hurt, you have to stay, uh, abide by a curfew, um, you can't appear in certain places because you've, you've stolen from them or something. And violating those conditions is, I see some of the patrol officers nodding, is one of the number one things we arrest people for. And if we have a minute, I know that Deputy Chief Murat has an interesting story to tell about that, how that has a public safety and resource impact. It does. The idea of uh, violating conditions of release and arrests for those is important. It imparts consequence to the uh, justice system's ability to tell someone that we are going to let you re be released. We're not going to be as intrusive or uh, as we could be and to, to lodge you. Uh, it saves resources, but it requires that somebody abide by certain conditions. And yet, there are instances where even that doesn't take. We had, I think people know, a two very vicious felony assaults in Battery Park, just outside the door. Uh, the first involved uh, two men beating an individual into unconsciousness, such that he had to be intubated at the hospital. Um, and we made an arrest of one of those individuals at the scene, and an arrest of another individual for disorderly conduct. Uh, upon further investigation, we determined that the first individual had not been the primary physical aggressor and that the individual we had arrested for disorderly conduct had in fact been the primary physical aggressor and, and the real uh, author of the, the beating. But by that time, he'd been released because our uh, preference for small time, uh, excuse me, for lesser level citations such as disorderly conduct is to release from the facility. He was out. Mm -hmm. He and his friend then went and assaulted someone else in Battery Park within a few hours. They took an individual they believed to have uh, been a witness against them, although that was not in fact the case, and they slashed him. They slashed him with a knife to the tune of 27 sutures, and one of the other individuals kicked him uh, in the head uh, a few times. We arrested both of them the next day. One of them is still in jail. He's the one who is alleged to have wielded the knife. The other was given conditions of release. And those conditions of release included a curfew, included uh, rules not to, to re-engage with the person he was alleged to have assaulted, either of the two individuals, and uh, required him to stay at a residence in Williston that he listed as his residence. Uh, we encountered him again a few nights ago in City Hall Park after that curfew. We brought him back here. We were told by a judge to release him, although the second he walked out of the door, he would have been again in violation of that curfew. And so the judge said, well, you will have to address that. We arranged to transport him back to the residence that he claimed in Williston, only to find that he had in fact been trespassed from that residence prior to uh, the assaults that had happened, and therefore prior to telling the court that that was a valid residence for him. Uh, he had perjured himself. Upon telling the judge that he had perjured himself and was in violation of his condition of release for curfew, the judge said, void that condition. Let him out. <laughs> so we did. I'm wondering if someone would say what um, percentage of arrests are homeless people. Uh, okay. I don't know that we have a percentage on that. We don't have entirely accurate data <coughs> self-reported as to whether or not they're domiciled or not. Sometimes we have individuals who are between homes. Um, sometimes we have individuals who are uh, basically uh, out of doors by choice. There are people who have residences to which they can go, residences that are provided by the city or subsidized by various uh, entities, uh, nonprofits, governments, and yet choose to be in, uh, in the open. I'll say, um, but we don't have real data on it. it, it it's possible, you know, we have, <coughs> there, there's a transient. Or undomiciled um, um, indication on the arrest report, right? So that's information we, we can get for you. That's information that it's, it's probably not available online, right? But, um, but I, I would make the distinction of more so, a lot of our transactions with, with homeless individuals um, are about either severe intoxication or mental illness rather than an arrest for a crime per se. I think that's the number one transaction we'd have. I don't know, I see some patrol cops in the back. I want to make sure that that sounds right, but yeah. So we do have a lot of contact with the homeless. It tends to be, again, the nexus is mental illness and, and intoxication. Commissioner Harp, did you have a question? Yeah. Yes, I have a question about the, uh, the bail data. So um, bail decisions are going to implicate lots of different levels of criminal justice system. I'm wondering, and, and I appreciate 
gathering this information and making it available. I'm, I'm wondering, in what ways do you see it affecting BPD's policies or decision making? Yes, I, it's a, that's, a, that's a great question, and uh, I don't know, um, but one of the things that I feel we have an obligation to is like to provide this complete picture of criminal justice from our initial response to downstream the disposition of the case and the time someone spends uh, in jail. And so I think it's, it's interesting, like, so I have to say it is instructive to me that 20% of the people we arrest just don't show up for arraignments. Like, that's something... Uh, I'd like to talk to the, the court about. And not to say, like, you need to drop the hammer on them, like, somehow get them to arraignments, right? I mean, I think that would be um, more efficient. Um, but also, I think one of the things that's interesting is, um, anecdotally, I'll be honest, my cops were, like, saying two things, that there's a wide variation in judges' habits. And they also said, like, gosh, dang, no one ever gets bail. But we could say now, like, no, in fact, you know, some states have gone totally away from cash bail. Some states have gone to very, very minimal cash bail. But whether my cops want to hear it or not, like 20% of the people get bail. Um, you can argue about the, so I'm just looking to, this is one poor cop standing in the back, but um, you, you can say it's not enough or I don't think it's fair, um, but I can tell my officers that that, that that is a fact, that one in five people will get bail. And uh, we can't say that the variation between judges is not as, as wide as people anecdotally thought it was. So. Um, it lets our officers know there is there is consistency where they thought there may not have been. Can you also, can you advocate for this information being collected somewhere other than just kind of assigning someone to kind of sit in the courtroom and, and collect it? Or, I mean, is, is that going to be a, a kind of stable way of getting this data in the future, or is there another way to? That's a great question. I, I think right, right now we have this big data set. Um, <clears throat> we have it because we capitalize on the fact that we're there every day and we have an interest in it. Um, you know, I think that if we're interested in like a, a beginning to end look at criminal justice, like, you know, someone should be collecting this data and not just, we do it for our, not just for our arrest either. I mean, I, I, it's not a huge haul to make this data available in public and then to look into plea bargaining and into sentencing. Yeah, one thing that I, I felt was missing from this analysis that we just didn't have was whether the bail like worked, like whether people who were assigned bail actually were more likely to show up to their next Subsequent court. hearings. Um, we don't have any way to know that. I mean, the one thing I will say is that the court definitely has this information because they have to keep track of who gets bail and who pays it. You can only just find out like one individual at a time. So I'm not sure how they would put it all together and make it public, but like it is theoretically possible. Have you had any contacts with them about either you know kind of standardizing that information or getting make, getting access to it? So I think I think those conversations were had before Nancy uh, joined us. So our okay. prior data analyst Eric Fowler uh, worked closely with them initially to try to have that happen on their side because that obviously would have been the more efficient uh, way to do it. And it seemed, and I could be speaking, uh, uh, I remember it incorrectly, but, but I believe the issue was that their data system just wasn't nimble in a way that they could do that. Um, and, and it could be that they are uh, thinking about new. Uh, uh, data rec record management systems. Um, hopefully that would happen because it, it, I think it is an old system that they were using. What year, that was, that? Was, uh, what year was that? Sorry. Uh, so this is uh, 20 months now we've been doing this? Right, 2017. Okay. Yeah. So if you look at, I'm sorry, Eric. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, please. I actually work at the court and that's why I came tonight because this interests me. And we use a 1983 system that really doesn't have this kind of data. It, it has very minimal stuff. It's, it's DOS, it's <laughs> there's no mouse, it's, it's really, really limited. But in summer of next year, we're getting a new case management system which should have a lot more information. So hopefully that'll change. Is your name Zachary by any chance? Is that, hey, nice to meet you. Yeah, seen him on Twitter, thanks. Um, yeah. <laughs> No, listen, that's a good, um, and so interestingly, if you look at, like, Barry Stuntz is a legal scholar. Before he died of brain cancer, he wrote The Collapse of American Criminal Justice, and he said that even more so, uh, you know, police decide who to bring to the court by collecting evidence and people, bringing them to a judge. Um, it is the behavior of the court system and prosecutors and defense attorneys that have probably the most lasting outcome on uh, a person's, like, subsequent interactions and, like, life course in criminal justice, and then he specifically went into plea bargaining, is plea bargaining is the number one determinant of um, somebody's sort of fate uh, as whether they end up 
and there are huge disparities in uh, by by race and by class about somebody's susceptibility to plea bargaining. But you know, because if you have a, a high caseload and your de defense attorney is a public defender, and you have um, a lot of people to get off your docket, and you know, you could just plea them out, right? Uh, wealthy people that have private uh, defense attorneys are less likely to plea bargain. Um, race and class are closely implicated. So I think one of the interesting things would be uh, if someone were to collect this data would be to see throughout Vermont, because we have pretty progressive prosecutors here, but they really vary statewide, like what role plea bargaining plays in the pipeline. Um, and you can Google this. France just passed a law that you are not allowed to collect data about what judges do or analyze the decisions they make uh, using data. In France. In France. So serious. So there, there you have it. Um, so I don't know. OK. We're not France. Thank goodness. OK. Um, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thanks for the Thanks, update. Nancy. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Nancy. Um, next on the agenda is, um, <coughs> let's see, update on the role of commission for citizen complaints. This is, just to remind the commissioners, this is part of the pilot that we have been working on. Um, we brought the uh, our revised document before public safety, and they asked us to make a couple of changes. Um, and I don't know, Shireen, if you want to, I know that you are working on some. Yes, yeah, so I was possibly going to revise it this last month, but in lo looking at it further, it looks like it should just stay the way it is um, in talking with the um, city attorney. So the last draft that came, I don't know if folks had looked at it for last meeting, but that's the one still on the table. That was the one that we had voted on. <coughs> I said, so okay, good, yeah. Right. Um, what I don't know is we'll bring it before public safety because that we need to do that. But in light of this new task force, it, the whole thing could be revised. So, right. But we'll bring it to public safety just so that they have it. And uh, we can give it to um, the new task force that's being formed so they can check it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any other commissioner updates or comments? Anybody has? I just have a question. Yeah, so I, I, again, I, I understand that some people on city council were uh, concerned about the extent to which they had access to um, disciplinary decisions and, and body cam footage and things like that. And so I was wondering whether there was a way of, of apprising city councilors earlier or even more broadly about uh, matters that the commission was looking at or matters that, that, that BPD was looking at as far as possible disciplinary actions. Listen, I, I, I support that idea. I, I think if, 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 if commissioners, one of the tensions is commissioners who are hesitant to um, take the information in executive session or take it and hold it confidential. And there comes a point where. Do you mean counselors? I'm, excuse me, yeah, of course. But Sorry I just that. wanted no, to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you guys do hold stuff in executive session. Um, and so, you know, one, if, if, if it's something that is clearly going to have a high impact in the community and it's going to be newsworthy and that people need to hear about, like, I support releasing that stuff uh, as soon as we get our footing on it. Um, if it's something that's an ongoing investigation, uh, especially of a serious but internal matter, for example, or something that um, doesn't merit immediate public disclosure, I do support briefing uh, the, the council, but um, in that, it, there is an element of um, confidentiality to it, right? It, same thing with the, if you're considering, you know, serious discipline against the electric company, so um, employee. So if folks are, and, and you know, to, it wasn't um, comforting to see the, the council feel like they were caught in the headlights when those two lawsuits came out. Like, it, it seemed like it would have been an easy matter to tell them this thing is inevitable and here it is and I want you to know about it. Um, and counselors felt like they were out of the loop, but yet like, you know, they're, they're, you guys are nominally appointed by them, we're working together as sort of like a team. So I, I would support, maybe the task force will come with that, a means by which to periodically brief the council on this stuff. I, I don't have a problem with that. And I think, Randall, it's a good point. I think that's hopefully, we, the ta this task force, right. that can be one of the items that. Uh, I just want to kind of, right, I mean, I, under the current framework, whether it's kind of summary information that can be given, which is, which doesn't get so specific as to right. potentially violate confidentiality or violate executive session, but can still be kind of summary information presented. Sure, if there could be general data or something like that, or just we're looking at two cases and one right. is a termination case, and yeah, no, that that seems. Well, yeah, and I think we had put that in the re our annual report. Maybe we hadn't, <coughs> but I I thought we had contemplated um, that maybe following executive session. That's when we could do it. 
but it, by the time we finish executive session, sometimes it's 11 o'clock at night. So the other option is that our next meeting is to report out what we did in executive session in general terms, right? So how many cases, et cetera. I mean, that's one option is so that monthly we're keeping up with it and gather that data. But that's not to the city council. That you mean just in a public? Well, way. just it for the public in, our, in right. terms of our minutes as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think those are two different questions, right? One is kind of whether city council can be updated in some <coughs> yeah, in, in some higher priority fashion, and also kind of how we how we disclose that information. Right. And I would think the task force will come up with right. Do you want? Will they want monthly reporting? And because it does become a matter of how and when. And yeah, that's a good question. Right. No, I assume, it, I assume it will be looked at by the new task force, yeah. but it seems like, again, th those recognitions are supposed to be done yeah. by November, yeah. right? Um, it's yeah. June right now. <coughs> I, I think it's also important to, in the task force work, to understand the degree, frankly, to which the, you know, council may be a body that we advise with things, but is not a disciplinary body or a body that, like, weighs in on the investigations, because it's important for them to be apprised, but it would be a whole different matter for, yeah. you know, you, you guys to counsel me on um, what you think the outcome of an investigation should be, and the council to say, I have this opinion about how the investigation should go. So I think as we go towards transparency, we should also delineate, like, the process in a way that, like, makes it clear who has the authority to recommend, who has the authority to account, what the schedule is, and, and whatnot. And, and, you know, it's interesting. Everybody, this is just my perspective, and I do think the whole disciplinary thing is important. Where I stand is I can't do anything about the past, but the past can inform the future, and the only way to get to the future is what you do in the present. It sounds a little esoteric, but I believe it. So I keep thinking of we can have the best use of force policy on the planet, but we still have individuals out at 2 in the morning and it's, it's human beings, how do we equip officers for, with emotional management, with empathy, with compassion, um, so that those, those use of force things can be executed in a way that serves the community and quite frankly serves the officer? Because I don't believe any of our officers want to hurt people. Um, I don't. They went into policing because they want to help people. Um, so. This is where my mind's going, and we keep talking a lot about the discipline, and that's great. I, wanna, I want to figure out ways that we can <coughs> train, equip our officers with that other piece that I just talked about. I just want to put that out there. So, I mean, I think it's important to reiterate that when people are troubled by the conduct they saw, these are officers that were called to a scene, activated a body camera, took the actions that they took, took that footage, downloaded it, and gave it to a defense attorney. I mean, it wasn't like um, this was discovered by third party. Cop Watch did not bring this to, um, to light. It was the officers who filmed what they did and handed it to people who have the authority to then inform um, you know, civil litigants and um, bring the cases to court and show it to a judge. So it just reflects on your thought that like these are officers out there making these decisions. And to say like, um, it wasn't like, wow, I hope nobody notices that this happened, you know, that this gentleman like uh, hit his head and passed out when uh, I shoved him. The, the officer, there was no tampering with the footage. It was, it was distributed to everybody who had a stake in holding the officer accountable. So a lot of it goes back to, um, you know, making the right decision in situ in the moment under all these pressures. Well, and, and for me, I feel like, do we want discipline and fear of discipline and fear of public to inform an officer's behavior? Some people might say, yes, absolutely. And in the short term, that works. But once six months is gone, that doesn't work anymore. What works is ongoing training, ongoing um, empathy training, ongoing um, really heart-based <coughs> training and, and emotional management training. That's kind of what ongoing is going to have long and uh, lasting effects, in my opinion. Sure. Oh, I was just going to ask if you have any data or evidence from around the country that backs that up, because you see so, many, so much evidence of training programs that actually don't reduce significantly any sort of So I was just wondering if that's just like based on your feelings about it or if that's based on 
data and evidence? Well, it's funny that you ask. I don't have data, data, but I have been researching folks that do this kind of training. There's actually an institute called Heart Math Institute, and there's two folks that they have that work with military and police officers on this type of training. Um, I don't have that data to show how, what the effects have been. I have anecdotal stories about that. Um, so I don't have any solid data on it. But. Um, okay. Let's see. That was Commissioner. Yeah. So I do, just to follow up, I think what Randall was saying that I think between now and when we actually finish this task force and we get recommendations and move forward in whatever direction, I do think it. I did hear the same as others heard at the city council meeting of a desire to be kept informed, and you know I don't think there's ever been a mechanism to do that nor an expectation, but now. It seems to me we've been made aware that there is an expectation. And consequently, I think that we should, at least on an ad hoc case by case basis, if not, you know, some formal procedure, when we, between now and, and when we finish this task force, if we have significant cases that we're reviewing, that we decide that we also need to uh, communicate that to the City Council and we can decide at that time how to best do that. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I heard very clearly their frustration at not having heard, you know, in advance about the last ones. And I don't think it was anyone's fault. That's not how we've operated. But now that we've been made aware of their desire, I think it's important that we respond to it. So I wanted to follow up on Randall earlier in the Q&A at the beginning had commented about someone else could explain about how, I think, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but how complaints <coughs> Uh, what the process is, right, in general terms. So I didn't know if anyone in in attendance is wanting that information. I gave that in the statement to the press um, a month ago, but I didn't know if anyone wants background on, on what our executive sessions look like without talking about a particular case, how a case comes in and, and how it's handled, or I, I don't want to talk just for the sake of talking and take up time. So if anyone feels like they want that, you can con you can Talk to us. Yep. I just wanted to make a comment um, that I relate to what you're saying, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm really concerned, not just, I mean, you mentioned, you know, how does a police officer feel when they're afraid of coming under discipline, but I'm also very concerned about the impact on the um, culture of the police department if police feel that um, anything that they do wrong will be covered up and exonerated. Um, and, and I think that um, that also needs to be looked at in terms of present time reality, in terms of how people act in the moment. If, if they're going into a situation and they think, no matter what I do, um, my uh, institution that I am employed by will support me and back me up, um, they're going to be feeling very different and acting very different than if they feel in those moments that the um, accountability will be held. <coughs> and, and I understand that, you know, human beings are very complicated. Um, but I, I guess what I feel like is, as a community member, when I uh, watched the Burlington City Council meeting, I was concerned about a general tone of, um, you know, uh, kind of case building in favor of those individuals who have done harm to our community. And I'm really uncomfortable with that in terms of, you know, if I was in that situation I and I thought I might not be held fully accountable for my negative behavior, how does that impact how I act when I'm out on the street? Yeah, no, thank you for Yeah, I mean, you're. Co I'm, I'm, we're hearing your comment. Yeah. And, and you know, so in terms of like a, a you know, pro like behind closed doors process that you engage in, you know, I, I hear some folks here really asking hard questions of you know one another, and, and I'm wondering if that uh, typifies your conversations behind closed doors. Do we have hard conversations asking those questions? Yeah. I, yes, we do. I mean, we've spent hours talking about I mean like like I said it's it's uh from my in my opinion the process has had integrity we've chewed on things we've disagreed with each other we've debated so um, yes 
We also wrote a, a directive um, a few months ago that makes it clear that uh, failure to report misconduct or corruption is an act of misconduct or corruption. That's available online as well. That's something that uh, I wrote for um, this police department that exists in other places. I think it's a unique procedure uh, or directive in, in Vermont, but you know, the idea that you know, officers should not have an expectation that, that, that what they're doing will be you know, exonerated or, or covered up. And, and one of the things, you, you may disagree with the conclusions or the outcome, but when we think a case rises to a level of seriousness, we also don't investigate it ourselves. We hire outside investigators, so I can't be accused of like a buddy or a peer or an old friend investigating uh, a case. And again, you may think that the punishments weren't severe enough. You may think we came to the the wrong conclusions in some cases, um, you know, when, and, and, and I don't, uh, want to go down the road too much of active investigations, but I was testifying in Montpelier about drug policy reform when I got a call from Deputy Chief Murad about finding Mr. Kilburn deceased, and we said, you know, you need to call the state police to investigate that. That uh, has a nexus to our um, interaction with them a few days ago, and, you know, we don't want to investigate that ourselves. So people might say that's one police investigating another police or something like that. You may find fault with that, but uh, the, the goal here is not, uh, you know, cover-ups or exoneration. And when you look at, you know, officers that get suspended for any period of time, uh, the next penalty after suspension is is termination. So um, that's on the table for a suspension, whether it's a 2, 10, or 15-day or suspension. And we have, in the past, terminated officers for subsequent offenses that have been suspended. I don't think they'd call that a, like covering up for them, is what I'm saying. OK. Um, next is uh, <coughs> consent agenda. Does anybody have any changes, modifications from the minutes of the previous meeting? A motion to accept that? Yeah. yeah. How much? <coughs> to... Okay. Second. second. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, next meeting's agenda items. Well, I don't know if the city council will have approved the social media policy, but that keeps getting bumped. Um, we'll see. If they've approved it, we'll put it on uh, to look at that in terms of our media policy and the city's social media policy. Um, the next meeting is June 25th, so the task force will not be formed yet. Um, does anybody have anything right now? Uh, if not, we can, you know, talk over the next couple of weeks. Yes, Bob. <coughs> to, uh, get an explanation as far as the report that was sent to us, the annual report from the police department, and just put the, ask the chief if he could please uh, with respect to the decrease in domestic violence, is that trend, if you can explain next mm -hmm. time, is that trend continuing and if there's a reason for it, because it seems very encouraging. And so then uh, I guess the only other one I would ask is there's an increase in aggravated assaults, and I wondered if uh, uh, a, a fairly dramatic increase in aggravated assaults. Now, if I wondered if that might be somehow attributable to the fact that you have uh, people Basically, it sounds like coming in and out of the court system without uh, really respecting it. Uh, and in other words, it seems as, is this uh, the same old troublemakers or is this uh, something else? So just those two issues, if you could please. Uh, okay. Because I think they have a real, particularly the domestic <coughs> violence one seems like very good news. So, Chief, that's the data from last year's report because right. we didn't update the data. So it, would it be interesting to see what that data looks like this year? <coughs> yeah, there has been an increase in aggravated assaults. There's been a modest decrease year over year in domestic assaults. There's been a notable decrease in burglaries. So we can so, talk. So can you put it Sorry. next? Chief, next. We did look a little bit into those aggravated assaults, yeah. if you recall. Okay, yeah. For the next, I was just thinking for the next. Can you answer it in like a minute? Good idea. Thank yeah, you. Just very briefly, uh, just we, we did, um, you know, we, we looked at a decent proportion of them and found that a lot of those aggravated assaults um, actually were uh, drunken fights where someone punched someone and someone fell down and hit their head on the sidewalk and suffered a uh, yeah, head injury. And so it uh, rose to the level of aggravated assault. We're, we're looking to see if there are any trends. We found that they did make up a decent proportion. Mostly downtown hours at night. Yeah. Okay. 
people doing a good job as far as uh, policing the patrons or the bars doing a good job of policing the patrons? Well, it's interesting about the question of over-service. I think that we have a big nexus between violence and intoxication downtown, uh, especially if you look at the use of force presentation I gave. Um, and uh, we looked at, we overlaid uh, time and day of the week and use of force and reported incidents. And there's an overlay between like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 10 p.m. to 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. I think is the strongest. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Uh, and that that correlates with bar fights. Yeah. And one of the worries is that the Liquor Authority does a lot of licensing work. They do a lot of work, not just like on-site enforcement. And I, I sort of wish, and I'll, I've said it many cases, uh, many times I'll say it publicly, I wish that they would do uh, more aggressive enforcement of over-serving, overcrowding, et cetera. In the past they have, so maybe you should talk to them. Yeah. Um, sure, we get it piecemeal maybe, when we ask for it, but not consistently. Whoever has to talk to them, but they have in the past. Um, okay, so what typically happens is there'll be some agenda items that come up. Yeah, I mean, I have some ask. ideas, yeah, but I have to talk to some folks to see um, who can come. Okay, so the next meeting is June 25th. Does that work for everybody? Make sure we As have a quorum. As you know, I won't, I won't be here, but we'll have okay. a perfectly capable person. Okay. Great. Um, is executive session needed tonight? Yes, we have two uh, updates on internal investigations. Okay. Can I have a motion to go into executive session? What is it for? I'm sorry, I didn't for, hear. For, uh, disciplinary matters. Oh, okay. I move that we go into executive session for disciplinary matters. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So we will do that. And thank you, everybody, for coming.